Over the next few programs, This is America and the World will examine the special bond between the United States and Japan, a relationship built on shared values, respect, and cooperation. We'll visit with guests in both countries and take a look at the cultural and especially economic ties that bind. On this program, we'll explore the many ways in which Japan is not only working with the United States, but working in the United States. Japan's presence here in America involves everything from making quality products to creating jobs and supporting local projects in education, community, and the arts. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the U.S.-China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States, the Rotondaro Family Trust, Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow. The Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward thinking, public policy. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Americans are so familiar with Toyota that we lose sight of the fact that it's still a Japanese company. We visited the Toyota plant in Georgetown, Kentucky, and spoke with President Susan Elkington about Toyota's importance in Kentucky and its long history in the heart of America. Uh, would it surprise a lot of folks uh, driving around in a Toyota uh, that that Toyota was made in Kentucky? You know, I hope by this time and age, they, it wouldn't be so surprising. Um, Toyota's philosophy is, is that we build our vehicles where you know, our customers buy them and drive them. And Toyota has been building the Camry for going on 30 years mm. here in Kentucky. How many cars have come through, have been produced here in Kentucky over that period of time? 11 million. 11 million cars? 11 million cars have been coming off of our lines. So what happens here now? You know, this facility is a very large facility. It is one of Toyota's largest facility in the world. And in, it's more than just final assembly. Uh -huh. We actually make the dies that stamp the panels, the side panels of our vehicles and our doors. We stamp those panels here in-house, we weld, and then we paint and assemble. It takes about 20 hours to go from raw material to a completed vehicle. Whoa. In addition to that, we build the engines from the block up to the final engine assembly. We produce over 650,000 engines here at this facility. What brands are coming out of the Kentucky uh, operation here? Here in Kentucky, we produce the Camry, beautiful car, um, the Avalon, which is America's Toyota, and the fact that it's actually designed, styling is done here in the United States, and, and it's produced here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the Lexus ES. This facility here is the only facility in the United States that builds a Lexus. Hmm. How many workers are working in this incredible plant? We have over 8,000 Toyota full-time employees here at this facility. What are the Kentucky workers bringing to the equation? You know, the Kentucky workers, one of the great things is, is, is the work ethic and the pride in what they do. Um, every day when I see the team members come in and they're wearing their Team Kentucky shirts, it tells you that they have pride in, in where, where they work. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if they have a Camry or an Avalon shirt, they might be wearing that too that day. So they have pride in the product that they produce. So I think that's one of the great things that they do. The other thing is, is there's some great universities and um, technical schools around. So the t technical knowledge that's available in this area is also very strong. And I think mm -hmm. that's important um, in any industry, especially in our manufacturing industry, for us to partner with these great institutions to, to, to continue to develop our workforce here in the United States. So Toyota has created a lot of jobs. Yeah. So here in the state of Kentucky, those 8,000 turn into 25,000 jobs across the state. How, how so? You know, besides our jobs, of course, that feeds into suppliers. And also you have logistics um, in many other ways that our particular products impact someone else and provides in, in jobs and employment. I sort of think of, the, of, of, is there something that you know of in the Japanese business ethic that is so involved in community, so committed to corporate responsibility? It's this community that invited us 
to join them. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create, give great honor to that relationship. And in order to give that great honor, we have to give back to that community. Well, giving back to the community, a little reading I did, yeah. Toyota here in just this area, involved in the zoo, involved in the science center, involved in the urban yes. league. It just goes on and on and on. I mean, really right. involved in the community. Huh? You know, besides the fact since we started here in Kentucky, we have donated over $133 million to great causes here in the state of Kentucky. Wow. But actually every year, over 15,000 hours are volunteered by our team members. 2018, how does that look for Toyota? It's gonna to be strong, but it's gonna be pretty stable from what we've been seeing the last couple of years at 2.4 million vehicles is what we're expecting to be able to sell. Um, and then, you know, here at Kentucky, we have some great vehicles that are coming out. We're just launching the Avalon. Mm -hmm new design with the Toyota new global architect, which really improves the styling and also the ride and handle of the vehicle. So we expect some really great things from that car. I'm very passionate about Toyota. I believe in Toyota and I believe the great things that they've done here in the United States. We have 10 manufacturing facilities here in the United States, 1500 dealers, which actually cause an employment of 136,000 directly and indirectly jobs. You know, Toyota is here in the United States because we are an American company. And I can say I'm really proud to work for them. I love that Toyota is an American company. Toyota is just one example of Japan in the United States. As you probably know, America is now energy independent, but you may not know that we are now exporting our excess liquefied natural gas, LNG, abroad, and Japan is both a primary investor and customer in a partnership with Virginia's Dominion Energy. Don, over your shoulder, I see Dominion Energy. Tell us a little bit about the company. Dominion Energy is one of the largest utility companies in the United States. We both generate electricity and transport it. We also transport natural gas. Uh, home base is uh, in Virginia, huh? Yes, we're uh, headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. We have 16,000 employees and we operate in 17 states. We're here in Cove Point, Maryland. How does all that come about? That, it, it's a very interesting story. Uh, Cove Point, the facility we're in today, was actually constructed in the late 70s. And it was constructed in the late 70s to import natural gas. Import? Import, exactly. Now, we imported natural gas at this facility for a few years before the market changed. And then the facility was mothballed. So fast forward to 2002. 2002, Dominion acquires Cove Point. We bought it from another energy company for the purpose of importing natural gas. Okay, uh-huh. So, that's how the uh, Cove Point became part of the Dominion family. For a long, long time, almost until recently, the United States was dependent on getting energy from outside. Now, we are independent. We're gonna take that a step further and export some of the excess that we have. Complete that picture for Very me. good. As I was talking about with Cove Point, when we acquired the facility in 2002, we re reactivated the facility to import natural gas gotcha. in 2003. In the next five years, we doubled that capacity. But something really interesting was happening in the U.S. energy market, uh -huh. a big dramatic change. Mm -hmm. It was the Shell Revolution. So we had discovered ways to access gas that previously was untapped vast amounts of resources that were suddenly available due to horizontal drilling, the ability to access gas that we couldn't before. Now, uh, when they talk about shale, right. just as a you're kind of a layman, explain sure. what shale gas is and the conversion process to liquefied natural Sh gas. Sure, shale gas is available in many places in the United States. So much natural gas they have been compared to the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Wow. That gas is far underground. And what we do now through drilling technology is they drill down deep, 7,000 or more feet. Right. They go horizontally instead of just vertically. Uh -huh. And that enables them to capture so much more natural gas. So now we're in a position where historically 10 years ago, we were importing natural gas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today, as of last year, the middle of last year, we are a net exporter of natural gas already. So tell us about the process of the liquefied natural gas 
coming from the United States and moving across the ocean to Japan, which needs energy sources, huh? Yes, we're very happy to have long-term agreements with such great counterparts, critical allies in the United States and Japan. So if you go back, Dominion was in a position where we had acquired an import terminal. We doubled the capacity, uh -huh. but the world was changing. So we started to look at our ability to develop a liquefaction project that would enable us not only to import gas, but also export gas. Uh -huh. So then you go on the market search. The top market for LNG in the world is Japan. They use a lot of LNG. Uh -huh. And so we started our discussions with our Japanese counterparties. Now this was right after Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So the energy mm -hmm. landscape was also changing dramatically in Tokyo. Because nuclear was off, That's off exactly the table. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And so that is how this relationship began. We allow uh, our customers, what they will do is they'll acquire natural gas on the interstate market. Uh -huh. They'll ship it to Cove Point, uh -huh. to transport it to Cove Point. At the inlet, we take that gas and then we liquefy it. We turn it into LNG mm -hmm. and we either put it in storage for them or take it directly to their seagoing vessels. Uh -huh. And so we'll put that LNG into their ships and then they will transport that LNG via ship back to market. And then what they'll do on the other side is they'll regasify it yes. so they can use it in Japan. Energy is the lifeblood of an economy. And so this is truly a, a very good story for both countries. Wow. Don, thank you so much thank for you. the education. Thank you. In Tokyo, I met with representatives from the Japanese trading company Sumitomo Corporation and the gas company Tokyo Gas. They're working with a third party, Kansai Electric Power Company, to purchase American gas through Dominion Energy. How much of, uh, of energy in Japan has to come from the outside? You know, almost, almost we rely on the 99 yeah, percent. So the gas that's coming through uh, Maryland, mm -hmm. through yeah. Dominion, yeah. where is that gas coming from? Uh, the northeastern area. So the northeastern area, right. and it's going oh, into oh. the Maryland right. huge facility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then from there, mm -hmm. uh, being uh, shipped mm -hmm. to Japan. Huh? Right, yes. right. So your company mm -hmm. is a, like, they call it a trading company. Right, right. What does that mean, a trading company? Huh? Oh, uh -huh. Very uh, difficult question. And, but uh, this business model itself is a very uh, unique business model in Japan. Ah, how very, so? How yeah, so? Very, uh, simply speaking, we cover all industry global basis. Not only trading, but also recently we are concentrating on the uh, investment. Is energy a big piece of the pie? Yes, of course, and um, one of the best, uh, one of the most important things. So the gas piece, mm -hmm. how did uh, th the gas get involved with Sumitomo? Yeah, of course, uh, we imported from uh, LNG mm -hmm. from uh, more than five or six countries, and then now we uh, met, uh, we create a joint venture with the Sumitomo Corporation mm -hmm. to uh, build up uh, this project. Now. Uh, we are planning to import from Coal Point, uh, of course, 1.4 million tons of LNG per annual. So it's a will be a 10 percent, about 10 percent of our energy. We are Sumitomo Corporation, have a subsidiary company, PSE Pacific and Summit Energy. Mm -hmm. They are uh, buying gas, and we are uh, distributing this gas to Dominion, mm -hmm. and we are set up and uh, Tokyo with Tokyo Gas and uh, ST Cob Point. Mm -hmm. We are asking and uh, Dominion to make LNG. Mm -hmm. ah. We mean that the Sumitomo Corporation yeah. and the Tokyo Gas. Okay, so you're and asking, yeah, them. yeah. yeah. And uh, the finished uh, LNG uh, product we are exporting to Japan mainly, mm. and the uh, Tokyo Gas and, and the Kansai, Kansai Electricity Kansai Company also. Uh, yes. yes. So, so uh, uh, three right. groups involved. Yes. So the electric, the gas, mm. and you are kind of at the head of the whole yeah, operation. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, would it surprise people in America to know that the gas is coming from the United <laughs> States? That we're exporting <laughs> gas. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Game is changed. <laughs> yeah, the game has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. From big business to the arts, the ties that bind. When Detroit's historic museum was in serious trouble five years ago, 
Japanese companies in southeastern Michigan got very involved. To tell this amazing story, let's first introduce you to the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts. The DIA, why is it such an important museum? Well, the DIA owns one of the best collections of art in the United States. Some of our greatest works are works by European artists. We are, for example, the best or the first museum in the United States uh, to collect a painting by Van Gogh. We are the first museum in the United States to collect a painting by Matisse. Mm -hmm. We also have an extraordinary collection of American art and especially a very strong collection of African-American art. This building itself is a work of art, isn't it? It is. It was inaugurated in 1927. It's beautiful uh, neo-Renaissance building. Mm -hmm. It's very imposing. It really um, represents a great example of uh, architecture for museums in the early 20th century in the United States. I read someplace, and you started off by saying this was such an important uh, museum that may be in the top five or six in the entire country. Huh? I think so. I yeah. think so. I would argue it's the number five in the United States. Number Absolute. five in the United Absolutely. States? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we were named in 2015 the uh, most uh, visitor friendly museum in the world, and there is a place that any citizen of the world should see, and mm -hmm. that is at the DIA. Mm -hmm. This is the murals by Diego Rivera, which is his masterpiece. Mm -hmm. It captures the very moment in which the automotive industry was created, and the automotive industry changed the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, all the races of the world are represented, and it is a song to immigration. So uh, and immigration mm -hmm. is part of this country, and Part of that history is represented very well here in these murals. And I think everybody should see this. These murals show the power of America, don't they, in a very interesting way. Absolutely. The power of America and the power of Detroit. That is what Detroit is about. Yeah. Hard work. It underscores the importance of the working class. And it's the first mm. time that, you know, in many ways, that the working class is represented in this magnificent piece. Salvador. Thank you so Thank much you. for your hospitality. In 2013, the city of Detroit declared bankruptcy. Creditors looked for any of the city's hard assets to pay outstanding debts and meet its pension obligations. The Detroit Institute of Arts was a major target. The chairman of the board of the DIA tells this amazing story. How did the Detroit Institute of Arts get, get caught up in the mess? In the 1920s, uh, the founders of the museum found it economically very difficult to continue as a private organization. So the, the, that group of uh, wonderful people donated the DIA and its building and its art collections to the city of Detroit. So when the bankruptcy happened, did the creditors come after the DIA? Well, the creditors, as you would expect, looked at what assets were in the city. Indeed. Because of the international recognition and uh, reputation of the museum, uh, it was thought to be a very, very valuable asset and really the only asset in the city. How much of a threat was that to the DIA? Very, very serious threat. Ooh. So it goes into the legal proceedings and they come up with something called the grand bargain. What was, what was it, who came up with the idea of a grand bargain and what was it? At the time, um, we had a situation where uh, the pensioners in the city of Detroit were looking at a serious reduction, if you will, in their hard-earned pensions. Ah, and they are human beings. They are, absolutely, and no one uh, was not mindful of the importance of those wonderful people, particularly police and firemen. So the, the thinking was, uh, how do we avoid wholesale sale of the art collection to keep the pensions intact? The judge came up with this well, idea? Well, the, the judicial mediation team, which was charged by the bankruptcy court uh -huh. with mediating many of these claims, thought about um, how can we help the pensioners on the one hand 
preserve the art on the other, and all of that's about money. Given that framework, um, we, um, foundation community, led that wonderful group with uh, 366 million dollars, mm -hmm. some 12 to 14 foundations. Uh -huh. The governor of the state of Michigan, Rick Snyder, showed great leadership, mm -hmm. brought the legislature together, and the state matched that sum. The business community in Detroit, which had been extremely generous to so many causes. Ah. And then to cap it off, because the DIA was going to be the beneficiary of survival and ownership, if you will, if we got through this, they asked us to raise $100 million. Whoa, lots of partners. And smaller businesses in the area, and yes. of course the big businesses, and the automaker, everybody got involved. That time, that place, those facts, all generated that uh, wonderful aggregation of support. Uh, the Japanese business community was remarkably generous in its leadership, helping us raise the hundred million that uh, we were required to raise. As a consequence of all of that goodwill and uh, fundraising, the bankruptcy judge awarded to the DIA the ownership the return over a hundred year turnabout, 90 to 100 years, of ownership of the art collections, the building, surface parking lots around the museum. So we're independent, if you will, now owned by a public trust. That's mm. a great story, and uh, as I say, the story is still building. Gene, so wonderful to visit with you. Congratulations, it is a great story. Well, thank you for letting me tell it. A Japanese business stepped forward to participate in the grand bargain to meet Detroit's pension obligations and save the DIA. How did the Japanese companies get involved with the Detroit Institute of Arts? I was called from Gene Gargaro. I got a letter from him. Uh -huh. Come to DIA and listen to his talk. I knew that the bankruptcy of Detroit, mm -hmm. but after that, what was happening, which is out of my area. Mm -hmm. But since I was there and listened to the, uh, these people's talk, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed that I, I think that we should help somehow. So if Detroit is in, in crisis, what can we do? How many uh, Japanese businesses came together and mm -hmm. how did you help? Well, since the Gene and the federal judge talked about, they are still short about 20 million to reach to $100 million. Yeah, that you was know, their piece of the yeah, pie. Piece, yeah. So I go back to Japan Business Society of Detroit, which I belong to. Then I, I, I talked to the executive level. Listen, you know, I, I got a very interesting talk today. And uh, this is not just interesting, this is that what we have to do. Rather than we do late, we would do earlier, quicker, and they agreed somehow, and I agreed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. collectively, yes. the companies came together mm -hmm. and they put up a few million dollars, yes. right? Well, including Toyota's big money of one million dollars, yeah. uh, we, we worked so hard to get the, uh, all the uh, money uh, to up to 2.2 million. So a total of 3.2 million dollars uh, were all collected maybe in about uh, one month and a half. And that encompasses uh, um, the about 20, 22 companies, large scale companies. Ah. And uh, there are small, small companies too, and individuals also. So in this area? In this area. So it's very important for the Japanese community mm -hmm. to be involved in the overall community mm -hmm. of Detroit, huh? Yes, very much so. The, through this DIA involvement, I could see a lot of the uh, friendship facts years ago has been already placed here in Detroit area. Detroit, United States, has such a long relationship and friendship with Japan, and that has been, you know, a hundred years ago or more. So that's an amazing story. Thank you very much. Today. Thank you, Tech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Special thanks to ANA Airlines and the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. For information about This is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the U.S.-China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President, the League of Arab States, the Rotondaro Family Trust, Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow. The Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward-thinking public policy. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.